Uh, to um, today's uh, IAMP One World uh, um, Mathematical Physics Seminar. It's a good to introduce today's speaker, Petola, and uh, uh, from Bonn and the Alt University. And she will tell us about on large deviations of SLEs, real rational functions, and zeta regularized determinants of Laplacians. So let me say that this usual seminar will be recorded and, and made available on, uh, uh, on YouTube. And having said that, or to Evelina. All right. Thank you very much for the invitation and introduction. So can you hear me OK? Yeah. Hmm? Can you hear me? Hear you. Yes. Yes. Hear OK. Yes. 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 Yeah, thank you because I don't see you either. So I'm hoping that uh, someone will shout if uh, there's an issue. <laughs> and if you have questions, just interrupt me, okay? And uh, yeah, so you see the title looks quite horrible. It's just the title of the paper I'm gonna talk about. But don't worry, I'm gonna explain what these terms mean. So you don't need to know anything beforehand. Uh, I was being lazy with inventing the title. And um, Right, so this is based on joint work with Elin Wong. So this is in, almost final version is in archive, but uh, there will be kind of final version after the journal has the backlog solved. Uh, it's gonna appear in, in YEMS sometime soon, hopefully. And um, yeah, there are actually many interesting connections to various things in physics and uh, other areas also in maths. And that's why there are so many different terms in this title. Uh, all right. So let me reveal the uh, plan. So where I come from uh, is the world of planar models, especially the ones who uh, are expected to be conformally invariant. So, you know, CFT for example. And what I'm going to talk about, it will be in the plane, but it won't be any statistical physics model as such, but it's just motivated by these questions. Uh, and uh, one success story in this area has been uh, understanding features of these models uh, geometrically. So in particular, looking at interfaces between different um, states, uh, crossing probabilities, things like that, still in the plane. And to describe these interfaces, uh, random curves now abbreviated as SLD were introduced by Ashram, was building on this uh, classical complex analysis theory from uh, 100 years ago by Lerner. So that's why we have two names. I will tell you what this is, so don't worry if you don't know yet. So people talk about SLE curves. So they are curves in the plane describing interfaces in critical modes. And somehow they are encoded by brown emotion. So they are quite canonical. And in particular, you have uh, naturally built in conformal invariance in these uh, models of curves. So that was uh, very successful to understand some features in this original motivation. But uh, the topic of my talk is only motivated by or coming kind of from these questions. But uh, so what we looked at is kind of a classical limit of these models of curves. And uh, rigorously, what does it mean? Well, it means that you look at some kind of large deviation problem. So there's some parameter which has kind of a classical limit that you can study. And um, this uh, limit, it's described by the rate function, if you will, for the large deviation principle. Uh, we have called it uh, Lerner potential, or it's sometimes called Lerner energy. So these are two different things, but they are closely related. I will tell you what they are. Uh, somehow, maybe it makes some physical sense also, but it's a little bit of a made up name just recently. And you can write this uh, object in various ways. And 
the most intuitive way maybe is to uh, relate it to partition functions kind of in, in these models. And how to do that, you find uh, determinants of Laplacians, which is uh, kind of naturally a partition function for the Gaussian free field or the free boson. And, um, and then the description becomes very geometric. And uh, something we found very curious uh, during the project was that uh, not only one can find a large deviation principle, that's not so surprising, but this uh, rate, so this energy is actually some quantity of uh, quite some interest in other things. And uh, here are some, some things that I listed. So there's a connection to real enumerative geometry. So accidentally, actually end up proving some conjecture from there when you want to classify minima of this energy. I will tell you about it. Uh, you find some semi-classical limit in CFT. Uh, there's also some relation to some uh, interbubble systems and actually some isomonodromic systems that I didn't write here. So it seems like this uh, object that was just meant to describe the semi-classical behavior has some connections to various areas. So this uh, kind of canonical SLE object is really uh, present in, in many, many places. So that's a story I'd like to tell you about. And the rest of the slides won't have this much text. So this was just a list of things I wanna say. All right, so let's get uh, started. I will quickly mention some motivation. So I think many of you are already very familiar with planar models, uh, but just to mention where these ideas kind of come from. So we look at some models in the plane of uh, random uh, objects, for example, atoms with spin. So this would be the easy model. Uh, according to some Gibbs measure <coughs> uh, on living on some graph or some lattice, in the plane. And uh, if these models are so-called critical models, one expects from randomization group arguments, heuristically, that if you take this lattice limit, lattice uh, continuum limit, so which we call a scaling limit, uh, you will find conform field theory. And maybe more rigorously, you will find some conformal invariance. Uh, in the scaling limit. Of course, in the discrete, you cannot have that, right? And that's been a long road, 20 years or so, there have been rigorous results using this geometric approach, SLE, which is supposed to describe, so if you look at this model here, you have two types of colors, which represent spin up and down, and you have uh, naturally interfaces between the two colors, which are you know, random curves in the plane. And uh, you can ask uh, what happens to these random curves when you take this uh, mesh size of this lattice to zero. And what happens is that they become certain random curves in the plane, which are these SLE curves, which can be uh, described uh, precisely. And there's a parameter involved, you will see it soon, uh, that's somehow attached to each universality class or each model, if you will. And uh, the kind of classical region will be, so the parameter will be uh, non-negative. And if you take uh, it to zero, that will kind of describe a classical model on curves in very kind of quotient mark uh, manner. And just since uh, maybe there are some very physics oriented people here, I insert this slide about the easy model so that you have some concreteness. Maybe just look at the picture. So this is the easy model in the plane with the two types of spins. There's a Gibbs uh, measure with some temperature. And it's very well known that uh, there's a critical temperature where a phase transition happens. So in low temperature, we have a completely ordered or quite ordered systems. And in high temperature, you have disordered systems. 
So I think the pictures are revealing it quite well. And at this critical temperature, you see quite fractal type behavior if you just look at the geometry of the picture. And uh, you see that correlations have some power law type scaling. And um, you can argue that this non rigorously, that at this critical temperature, the volume should be described by some conformability theory. And uh, okay, as I mentioned, uh, one way to try to understand what it means is to look at one interface. So this is a more precise setup. So I impose boundary conditions on kind of one, one side with the minus spin, the other side plus spin. And then I will always have a curve between X1 and X2, uh, which is separating the two, right? And that's a random curve. And you can ask then if you have delta times delta uh, grid, for example, you can ask what is the limit of that curve uh, in some sense of uh, weak convergence of measures of curves. So these uh, endpoints are pinned and uh, the grid here is becoming finer and finer. So that's a well-defined question to answer. And uh, here's the answer. It's a famous result. It's not the first result of this sort, but this is maybe the most celebrated possibly. So you can show that if you look at this interface between the two corners as a probability measure on curves, so it's a random curve, that probability measure converges weakly as uh, you take uh, delta times delta grid and then take the delta to zero, that converges to some object that we understand that I will tell you what it is. And there's a parameter, don't worry too much if you don't know about it, but there's so you can identify it. So celebrated works uh, initiated by Smirnov uh, led to this result. I should mention many other names in this context. So I'm cheating quite a bit. I'm only showing you one example. So of course there was Kenyon, uh, Schramm, Lola Werner, uh, who else? Chelkak, all these people and their descendants who've been working on these uh, questions a lot. All right, so then what is this limiting object? So you see all these pictures, they're very nice and maybe you get some impression what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, maybe one would want to know a bit more precisely, you know, what, what the limiting object is, except that it's some curve between some two points. So just as a short recap, I'm gonna work on a simply connected domain, D. I'm gonna have some marked boundary points. So in this picture, I have two of them. And I'm gonna look at curves between those points. So it's important that the points are on the boundary for my setup. And uh, one way to define these uh, SLE curves is that it's the unique family which of probability measures on curves which connect X and Y in, in the domain D, which are conformal invariant in the sense that if you move to some other domain with some other two points, you just push the law forward by the conformal map. And then it has a Markovian property that I won't need. So you either know it already or you don't need to know it. But the message here is that with these two properties, there's only one parameter left to choose and that's this kappa, okay? All right, it's still a bit abstract. So let me show you a more concrete picture how to generate them. So here's maybe a more concrete picture. So I'm generating it in the upper half plane, H. It's gonna go from this point, I guess that's my origin usually. It's gonna go to infinity, which is a boundary, boundary point. And uh, I can say that uh, I want to parameterize by some time. And at each time, if I look at where, where the curve is at that time, I can map whatever was already generated. I take its complement. Let's pretend it's a simple curve. I take the complement, I map, map it back to the above plane. 
And then I can start over from wherever this tip was uh, mapped. And this Markovian property is guaranteeing that somehow on this side, the law is essentially the same as on this side, but you need to mind a bit in which domain you are. And if you keep track of this evolution of the tip at all, all times, it will be moving on the real line, right? So this GT, yeah, it's here. It's a conform map chosen in a certain way from the complement, so here, to the upper half plane, kind of shrinking, collapsing this piece to the boundary. And uh, if you keep track of the tip, you will find a one-dimensional process, uh, which is uh, called the driving function. And uh, it will be some continuous function. For us, of course, it will be random, but it can be just a deterministic function. And yeah, this is uh, uh, 1923. So yeah, 100, almost 100 years ago, it was shown that you can generate any simple curve using this approach. And there's some detailed information about these conformal maps. Uh, I'm not gonna expect you to remember the equation. I just wanted to say that there is a recipe how to generate them using this theory of Lerner. Uh, so you plug in your driving function into this equation, then you solve it, you find your conform map. Because you have a conform map, you can go back and you find all this you know, time instance where the curve is. So you can generate the curve in this way. Uh, does it make sense so far? Yes, yes. It's, okay. uh... Excellent. So yeah, don't hesitate to ask because I don't see you. So I don't see if you're nodding or you know doing something else. I turned so my camera kind of... off because I have a very bad connection. What's that? I just turned my camera off because I have a very bad connection. So. Oh, I see. So it's, um, it's yeah, I hope my connection is fine. So that's learn evolution, like very classical from complex analysis. It was uh, invented to solve some problems in geometric function theory, but I'm not going to talk about it right now because I want to get to the kind of other more recent stuff. So it's almost the same slide. So now what I do, I plug in Brown emotion with some speed. And then I can generate. So this curve should look much worse. It's going to be fractal, but the sketch is just the same. I started calling it gamma. Uh, so that that would be my SLE curve. So one can show that if you generate your curve using brown emotion with this speed kappa, you get this uh, Schramm's process. So uh, maybe it's more concrete to think about, uh, yeah, random curve driven by brown emotion. Somehow this time evolution down here is telling you how much you kind of turn around over here. If you think about it a bit, maybe it becomes uh, quite obvious actually, somehow, how to grow conformally. So yeah, so there are two ways to think about this. First way is to just fix two points and look at all curves between those points with these two properties. And the second way is just, yeah, take standard brown emotion, put some speed for it, and generate this curve using all this uh, learner theory. And uh, that said, I can say that this is a very well understood object and quite canonical, as you can believe. And it's a conformal invariant in the sense that I describe it in the upper half plane, but then I can move elsewhere and I just uh, define it. For example, in this uh, square, I define it by a push forward of the uniformizing map from the other plane. So uh, everything works very nicely. Uh, okay, so there's uh, maybe for the experts mostly, a couple of slides about what to do if you want to have several curves, because you can, you find the interesting phenomena when you do that. So I want to carry that around during the talk as well. You just add more marked points. And if you want to think about some model, you can think about the easy mode again. 
with plus and minus pins. But now you put boundary segments, minus segments on this black pieces and plus segments on their complement on the boundary. And obviously you will have uh, several macroscopic curves and they may connect these marked points in various ways. So one way is in this picture, but there are other ways as well. And uh, you can show that this again, uh, if you take the scale limit for this easy model case, you will find this kind of several SLE uh, model in the scaling limit. And there's a certain parameter choice that you have that comes from a calculation. So it's some kind of consistency, which parameter matches which model. Um, and you can either decide how these uh, points are connected by the interfaces. So then you condition the model on having some extra property, or you can just omit that and kind of this theorem holds in both cases. It's a bit imprecise uh, here, but the message here is that uh, you can do it and it's concretely really related to the easy model. So this is again a natural thing to do. But now one needs to understand this uh, several curve process, of course. So I will tell you what it is in the next slide and then I get to a bit, uh, maybe easier things again. Yeah, question? Was there a question? No question, somebody had the, just the, the, uh, the sound. Yes, okay. Continue. So this is the definition of the N, N SLE or kind of several curve SLE. It's the theorem and the definition at the same time. And never mind this, these parameters too much. There's some technicality involved. So we will be interested near zero anyway, right? So this is one way to define uh, what it means to have a multiple SLE process. So first of all, we understand one SLE. So maybe this red one. Uh, and we want to understand how it's interacting with these other ones. If you think about the easing model, this kind of symmetry becomes obvious. So what is the symmetry? So if you have your setup with some marked points, and then you ask you know, the marked points to be connected in some way by these curves, and the curves don't cross each other. So they actually form a planar pair partition. You can count how many possible ways there are to connect. And, uh, now, if you require that uh, somehow by induction that you know already the previous case of n minus one uh, curves, so you already know where the black ones are. For example, for the easing model, you just observe them in some way. And you ask what is the law of the red one? So that is just supposed to be the usual one curve SLE that I defined you, but not in the whole domain but instead on this gray shaded one, because it's not uh, allowed to cross these other ones, right? So that is the random domain where it can be. So that's the gray part here. And uh, if this property is to hold for any choice of the red curve, symmetrically, uh, then there's a unique object, which we call a multiple SLE. It's maybe a little bit abstract too, but this is maybe the most concise definition. And the message again here is that we understand what this object is. Uh, and we can also write down some more concrete generation for it, but I'm gonna skip because I don't need it here. All right, so let me go back to the actual topic, if it was clear enough. So now what I wanna look at is this kind of classical limit. And uh, maybe I should say, so this simulation again is the easing model. And maybe these curves look a little bit fractal type. Of course, it's in the discrete. So uh, it's still somehow going like that. But the bigger the speed kappa for the Brownian motion, so that was the driving force of the curve. It was uh, like that. The bigger the speed, the more you kind of uh, 
the more fractal you become. So somehow the smaller the speed, the straighter you come because uh, then the driving force just becomes close to constant. So the driving force was Brownian motion times uh, square root kappa. And if kappa goes to zero somehow, the driving force becomes just identically zero. And these actually become kind of very straight. So they become hyperbolic geodesics in that case. So there are these green things here are supposed to be modeling that. But okay, so how to understand this precisely? So first of all, these gammas will be my SLE kappa curves. Maybe I have many of them. If you will, you can just think about one curve. So that's okay. And uh, I want to ask, maybe I show the whole thing. Uh, ask for a large deviation principle. So with this very small speed for Brownian motion, uh, it's very unlikely the curves to go far away from the optimal ones, kind of. And how unlikely? Kind of exponentially unlikely. So there's some positive, non-negative uh, rate, which depends on some reference curve, which is eta. So that's some chosen curve. Then I ask the probability of this gamma, so that's that one, to be somehow close to this where I want. And the most likely kind of configurations are those for which this rate is the smallest and otherwise it decays exponentially. So maybe the picture helps, it's a bit tiny. So the green curves in the picture are supposed to be these etas. So they are kind of very straight. And then these red ones are supposed to be gammas and they are somehow fluctuating around near mostly near this uh, green ones. And uh, so how to make it precise is given in the theorem. So if you've done large deviations, it looks very familiar probably. If you don't, you can just think about this uh, informal statement. Uh, so what I need to tell you is what is this rate? So that is the Levner energy. It was already introduced earlier by, by these people. And it was believed to be related to this large deviation problem, especially in Elin's PhD thesis. She had a very interesting work on, on this, on this uh, problem already. Uh, mm -hmm. Excuse me, the green lines are hyperbolic geodesics, are they? Or, uh... Uh, aha, so uh, I can choose the green lines any way I want. If I want to minimize this, this energy, meaning kind of maximize this thing, then I take hyperbolic geodesics. So that will be the minimum of this energy. So that will be the optimal state indeed. But I can choose some other one. I kind of choose some something, then I ask how close I am to that something. And if the something has somehow very large energy, so that's the energy, then it's exponentially unlikely that this property happens. Okay, so, so for hyperbolic geodesics, uh, uh, the, the energy is zero or? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, good. And uh, yeah, so that is the minimizer, minim minimum of the energy, the minimizer. And otherwise you have some non-negative value. And uh, okay, just a couple of remarks for, for experts on this. So it sounds like, okay, so we take some curves driven by brown emotion and uh, we have a very good understanding of brown emotion, uh, the large deviations of brown emotion, right? Uh, and somehow that's where this guy comes from. But now the map from the driving function to this curve is not continuous. If you have the usual topology for these functions, which is uh, topology on continuous curves, the SUPNOM, so we cannot just use the contraction principle. Uh, so that's why I have written like this. The other uh, trouble is that Schilder's theorem for Brownian motion, if you know it, it only holds up to some finite time. But what I need to do here, I start growing somewhere and I need the time to go to infinity so that I reach the end point. 
So I need to do also some kind of time go to uh, infinity limit. So the proof is actually quite, uh, quite a nuisance to do uh, precisely. And uh, yes, so Eileen uh, tried to do in her thesis. So she had some weaker results there and she introduced this Lovna energy for one curve. But we understood somehow that if we look at all curves simultaneously, uh, there's some connections to these uh, models in physics and actually you can somehow have some intuition. So it somehow helped us to look at the more complicated problem of several curves to also get the one curve case as a special case. Uh, right, so here are remarks, kind of mostly what I already said. The theorem the statement is the same, or you can think about this. Uh, so this is kind of trouble one, that you need somehow to get to infinite time. So that's the trouble one. Uh, and then there's the topological trouble. But this can be done with uh, some tedious estimates. Uh, luckily, some of them were done and some of them we had to do. So it's some standard kind of SLE stuff. Uh, and that's it. And then you get to multiple curves by information about how to generate them that I was hiding. So there's some basic uh, LDP theory that you can try to use and uh, a little bit of uh, technical work again and some understanding of uh, how to generate the multiple curves which have interaction from kind of independent non-interacting ones and how do you do that you have some kind of guy who's telling you the interaction it's called usually a partition function but now it's the sense of this kind of SLE model it has to do with some crossing probabilities in the lattice models so it's not so far, far from actual partition function so this is some kind of commonly used term in this area, but never mind if you don't know it, we don't need it here. So that's the first main result. Uh, any questions about this? Oh, it's all good. Okay, all clear. Yeah, so I hope maybe if you think about this, it becomes the uh, kind of clearest. And then if you're an expert, you can parse all this. Because you need to choose some topology, for example. So I didn't say it's the we choose the house of topology for the curves as subsets of this, let's say unit disk or whatever. And then uh, that's kind of natural in some sense. Then you could ask, can we do with stronger topology? So that's maybe something uh, one could try to think about. But uh, yeah, this was hard enough for now. So we were happy with that. But what I haven't told you is what is the rate function exactly. And uh, somehow that is actually quite an interesting object. And already we discussed a bit what is the optimal curve, eta. So that's the hyperbolic geodesic where the mini, uh, energy is zero. So this, uh, this is maximized. But then if you have several uh, marked points, it's actually not clear to classify the minima. And that is where we found something interesting. So I hope I will get there. But first I will tell you what this object is. So now the picture is a bit bigger. So now imagine that uh, the green curves again, I choose them somehow. And the red curves are my SLE curves, which fluctuate. And then, okay, so this yellow is supposed to be like a house of neighborhood, but I'm cheating a bit. So that's somehow the probability I was asking. And so what is the rate of decay of that probability when kappa goes to zero? And uh, to define it, I need to get back to the construction of these curves a bit. So this is the same theorem as before from 100 years ago. Uh, so I said we take an input, which is a real valued continuous function, and we can generate the curve using this recipe. Uh, and now you can associate the energy to that curve, which is motivated by Schilder's theorem for Brownian motion. You just take the Dirichlet energy of this driving function. You take the derivative squared. And you see this is not well defined for Brownian motion, of course. So it's only uh, well defined for a certain 
functions and one can classify what they are. So they need to be kind of regular enough so that this would be finite. But it's obviously non-negative, uh, right? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna say that this is the loaner energy of this one curve. That's quite concrete, I hope. And uh, now I want to give you a more general notion of this sort. And okay, so it's here we can start from the bottom. So that's the general notion. So an eta bar is, do I have it? So it's the tuple of some um, number of curves, maybe capital N was my number. So that's, that's that. Um, and it's actually more intuitive somehow when you think about the proofs to de define instead another functional, which you would call potential, and then take its minimum and okay, some numerical factor. And the energy is this thing whose minimum is zero, but the, the potential has some other minimum possible. And the potential is over here. Uh, so what is it? So it has kind of a non-interacting part of kind of just the independent curves separately. And their energy is defined in terms of this uh, the driving function. So now you need to notice that uh, the driving functions of all of them, they are somehow also interconnected because uh, these curves are not independent. And that's why you have this kind of interaction term that comes up. And uh, I will give a better formula in the next slide, but if you are familiar with Brownian loop measures, that's one way to write this interaction term. So you take your uh, green curves eta, eta one, eta two, eta three. Then you take uh, the measure of all Brownian loops that touch at least two of these curves. So maybe that's a Brownian loop, or there might be one which is touching everything. But you don't take those which touch just one curve. The measure of those is infinity. And you don't take those which don't touch anything. Again, because the measure will be infinity. So that is this thing. It depends on the curves and also on this domain that I'm considering. So mostly it's been this disk in the pictures, but you can move to some other domains and then uh, some things will change a bit. So this is actually invariant, but it's not invariant, it's this part. And this part is encoding the conformal moduli of the endpoints. So here I have, okay, these are two endpoints of curve eta j. So this is, let's say, x a j, x b j. And uh, yeah, these are the other ones, and these are the other ones. So there's some uh, explicit factor, which is uh, just the Poisson kernel. And uh, that was maybe a bit mysterious somehow, uh, what it has to do with anything. But I guess the philosophy one philosophy is that it's really encoding the marked points you have before you have any curves there. So this this part, and then you put the curves, you choose them somehow, and then you calculate this part, and it might be again infinite. Uh, so uh, if the curves are not regular enough, and uh, so that is how you find the rate function. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, what are uh, the points x sub a, x sub b? These uh -huh, are. So the, let me, the, let these me write are this. Yeah. So I mark the points first. Uh, oh, this is too small. Uh, maybe this is x. Uh, x a one, x b one. That's somehow for the one curve. Then here is, maybe I should choose some better ordering, but I hope you see what I mean. Yes. Two. This is eta two, eta one. And so, and so the, the Poisson kernel, you mean the Poisson kernel for the disk? Or Yeah, or... so this is for the disk, exactly. So it depends on the domain. So this is maybe, what's a good a unit disk? 
So then I should write unit disk. Uh, okay, that's component variant. So that's unit disk. Uh, and these two are actually invariant, so they don't care. And if I move to some other domain, I need to keep track of this part. So, so, so the, uh, this Poisson kernel, the, uh, could you recall what is its uh, uh, algebra? Um, what is the formula for it? It's, Oof. it's uh, an elementary I, function. Oh. Let's see. So in upper half plane, I might remember. So there it's, uh, if I have x, y, it's just something like one over, is that correct? So there's yeah. one, here's okay, one. Yeah, yeah. That... And then, okay, there's some formula in the disk. Yeah, okay, okay. But it has trouble if the points are the same. Sure. Yeah, and somehow I'm first fixing the points. Maybe it wasn't so clear. So I'm fixing the points, I'm fixing the domain. And I'm also fixing a configuration, which is this AIBI in a certain way, just for definiteness so that I have always this configuration. Otherwise I could somehow jump between, maybe I have this one. Yeah, so, so the, the, the domain is the disk. It is not the, the domain inside uh, be, between the green curves. Uh, no, no, not here. Okay. Ah, so it's, yeah, on the next slide, there will be something like that. So let me show it. And maybe we then go back here, because I think it's just here. Uh, yeah, sorry. There's a simulation for that will give the SLD curves and then this tubes, but it doesn't work with the iPad so nicely. So this is the other formula. So here's the same thing. And now you have these components. I think this is what you're asking. And yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so C, they will be these, C1, C2, C3, C4. So this is more intuitive, but you have to show that it's true. So first you define like in the previous page, a bit cryptically. Then you show when the, these curves are nice enough so that you can take the uh, Laplace Beltrami operator, take the zeta regularized determinant with a Dirichlet boundary condition. Uh, all of them make sense. So what you have is, is the total one. This is in the whole disk, minus all these pieces here in these components. Uh, and uh, th this is the Laplace Beltrami, the, the flat Laplacian or, or for the hyperbolic uh, plane? Uh -huh. So, okay, so it depends on the metric. So there's met, okay. So I, I'm talking about planar domain D, simply connected, but we can, here's a remark. So you can define it. At least you can make a definition elsewhere, but this large deviation principle, we only proved for this simply connected. So there's a metric G that I was simplifying, so hiding. So you can take the Euclidean matrix or you can take the hyperbolic or whatever, but it has to be the same for all of them. So yeah. let's say it's the flat metric. Or yeah, maybe the hyperbolic is better. And then optimal ones would be somehow geodesics. Uh, yeah, so, so, so this, does this determinant uh, depend on on which metric you take? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. So I can kind of add it. Yeah. I'm cheating a lot, actually. My apologies. Because I wanted to communicate ideas and somehow not put too much notation here. But you need to choose a metric. And once you've chosen a metric, you can define this guy by just comparing the Laplacians somehow overall, and then in all these components here. And there's a numerical universal number, which is just due to our, somehow the previous definition was more natural from the probability uh, theorem. Uh, and as it happens, if you use that definition, you will find. So this is actually what you find in the disk with just one curve, which is this, uh, how do you say, uh, unit, uh, 
interval. And uh, uh, yeah, so you have uh, this one, and then you have as many as you have these uh, curves eta. So there's some number of points and half of that many eta's, right? But this is universal, so it doesn't matter much. And this is really sensitive to the domain and the metric. However, there is a transformation rule. So if you studied some quantum field theory, you might have heard about the polyakov alvarez formula, which is a conformal anomaly formula for the determinant of the Laplacian when you change uh, your conformal structure or your complex structure. So uh, if you change the metric by some conformal factor, you will find a transformation which, uh, which has uh, uh, yeah, all kinds of terms depending on the area of the surface, maybe on the boundary uh, terms. So curvature on the boundary and curvature inside. And if you have corners, it will have contribution from the corners. And that is actually a huge uh, kind of technical trouble. So here, if I look at this domain, there are corners uh, here and here, right? So, uh, so what does, how does this detriment of the Laplace behave here? If you think about, so yeah, in terms of Brownian motion, maybe you start somewhere. Uh, if you have some complicated, or if you have some corner, the behavior is different than near some kind of straight segment. Uh, so we, in order to prove this identity, which is kind of much more natural than the previous one, maybe at least for a geometer, uh, we used some recent work by these people who actually proved this anomaly formula that we needed to use in the presence of corners. And to my knowledge, there's no rigorous proof before with corners, only for smooth boundary. There are very classical results about this. But uh, yeah, I hope from the picture is intuitive. It's kind of measuring the uh, somehow where these curves are and how you measure it is in terms of these uh, Laplacian operators and the Dirichlet boundary condition for all of them. So it's somehow, I guess the first guess you might have. Uh, all right, any more questions? Yeah, so then, okay, one could naturally ask, what if you look at curves on Riemannian surfaces or some more complicated domains? So what we believe is that this object, maybe modulo, you know, this constant doesn't matter. Uh, this will depend. This will uh, describe the semi-classical limit or the large deviations or curves in, you know, any geometry. If you have a proper geometric information here, but proving this rigorously, of course, will be, uh, uh, yeah, challenging. So that's just the conjecture. But as an object, it's very natural in all kinds of geometries. Uh, all right, I have a little bit more time, I think. So we can address maybe the minima a little bit. So that is now what I'm interested in. I call it potential. Remember that the energy was here. It's just the potential minus the minimum times some factor. Uh, this is somehow the classical, what comes from the central charge. So it doesn't matter much. It's just a number you see it here as well. Uh, and okay, there. So I will kind of focus on this guy instead because it seemed more intrinsic, for instance, because uh, of this identity here. Uh, is, uh, could you explain uh, more this uh, uh, M uh, loop? Uh. Uh -huh. I mean, the, you mentioned that this is the, the measure of, of some, of some uh -huh. uh, yeah. parts, Let's... but does it have, a, does it have a, a formula? I mean, can, can an explicit formula? Uh, the the, the not... measure of, of some loops, this sounds rather uh, abstract. It's not, uh, not explicit. So it's a measure of, uh, 
loops, which are kind of brownier loops. It's a bit hard to explain, but okay, so there. To take a Poissonian cloud of brownian loops in your domain. So maybe you have, so this purple is supposed to be that. And uh, everything I drew is not contributing to this thing. So what's contributing will be kind of big enough loops. So they have to touch at least two of these uh, curves I'm interested in. So this one, for example, um, but it's quite, uh, yeah. So I guess what I would say is that there is, it was introduced by Lawler and uh, Werner. I think there's a paper called Brony Loop Soup, something like that, in, in studying SLE and restriction properties. But it's a conformally invariant measure on loops, which is an infinite measure because of all the tiny loops. So you have kind of, you run Brownian motion, you condition, you kind of condition that it's making a loop. So the construction is a little bit uh, delicate to do. And you have of course infinitely many tiny ones. So it's an infinite measure, but it's a sigma finite. And if you look at just kind of macroscopic ones, like what I was trying to draw here, which are required to reach here and here, uh, the measure of those is finite. So then... Uh, uh, does this measure depend on kappa, on this parameter that... Uh, uh, no, so here kappa has been gone to zero already. So this is in the classical world. So in the SLE literature, where this appears, you will usually have a loop measure with some intensity and the intensity will depend on kappa. Uh, for example, if you take uh, uh, just a Brownian loop measure with certain intensity, you take all the loops and you look at the outer boundaries of those loops. You know, if I'm able to draw it, it's a bit, little bit off uh, topic, but maybe you know that if you look at outer boundaries of certain types of Brownian loops, you will find uh, so-called conform loop ensemble or SLA thirds. And uh, there's, then there's some kappa parameter dependence, but not in this case, it's just uh, somehow the object itself. But yeah, it's not so intuitive if you haven't seen it. And that's why I'm proposing this other definition with uh, determinants of Laplacians, because that's something I think one can understand better at least as a formula. But it's really this thing is measuring the interaction because you need to, you look at somehow if these curves are close together, then there are lots of prone loops connecting them. So then this thing will be big. And if they are far away, somehow this thing will be smaller, at least when you think, you know, intuitively, because you need kind of long loops to reach both of them. So something like that. Uh, but, um, yeah, does it make any sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, uh, thank you. So, uh, so you have uh, two uh, equivalent formulas for H of, uh, of A tab bar. Uh, right, so that's in, the definition. Yeah, and in, in, the, in the other formula from the other slide, you don't have this M loop at all. So, so maybe yeah. this is not, I mean, I mean. Yeah, so I say it's more intuitive. Yeah, more intuitive and, uh, kind of well, one can understand what what is the laplacian in this domain i mean it, maybe it is difficult to compute it but uh, it, right it's, it's okay thank you yeah so somehow the trouble is that here we need some more smoothness so we define it in the previous way and we show that this is uh, it's equal to that in regular enough cases for example hyperbolic geodesics or some other nice uh, yeah, any smooth kind of curves so that this Laplacian operators are fine. But it's somehow you need to show that they are the same. And I guess a priori it's not clear at all, right? 
but you know some conformal transformation properties. So it's not invariant, but there's this anomaly formula. And there's the same anomaly formula for this guy that is kind of encoded in the Poisson kernels. And these two guys are invariant. But it took quite a while to find the correct definition even kind of to, for, for this. So it wasn't easy to find it. Uh, there was earlier work by Ying for one curve case, maybe you know it. Uh, she found a connection with uh, detriment of the Laplacian operator with one curve in the inventiveness paper that she has. So uh, we had some idea that this should be something uh, similar to that. And in retrospect, it's very natural. But uh, yeah, when you start, you uh, it's not clear how to find it exactly. But uh, yeah, so that's maybe the nicest way. Then there's the numerical factor that one has to mind. But uh, maybe that's the nicest way to define it. Uh, okay, so then uh, let me see how much time I have. Let me mention a bit about the minima because that's interesting. Um, so then you could ask, okay, so, so which that, uh, was that? Is that uh, sorry, I just wanted to say that you have uh, five minutes, so maybe also a little bit more since we started a bit late. Oh, okay, excellent. So then, yeah, I think this is the most fun stuff that we got surprised mm -hmm. about. So we wanted to then say, okay, so uh, what are the minima of this potential? So which are the optimal curves? And of course, I told you already, they are hyperbolic geodesics, right? It's not so surprising, but you want to classify them and that's not so easy. So uh, first of all, you can notice, uh, that, okay, that we already discussed, that if you have a minimizer, it will be a hyperbolic geodesic, but in the sense of the symmetry again, because uh, it's not that they are independently hyperbolic geodesics, but each of them is hyperbolic geodesic in the complement of the others. So here, the picture is not so uh, good, but the red one here is supposed to be hyperbolic geodesic in the gray component and not in the whole disk. This is just the analogous uh, property for this multiple SLE. That was a theorem slash definition at the same time uh, using some Markov chain sampling, but uh, don't worry too much. It's just somehow that's quite easy to see that this must to hold. So then you ask, okay, do they exist? If you just have one curve, of course, there's a hyperbolic geodesic, right? But if you have several, uh, do you find uh, this with this property, this symmetry property in its own component? And yeah, so you can show that the potential, so this is a functional of these curves. The dot is eating the end tuple of curves. Uh, so it's lower semi-continuous in a certain sense. So therefore uh, there exists some uh, minimizers, but then you want somehow to say that there are not too many of them. And that was the difficult part. So maybe you, one can make a guess, because uh, how many different pairings of the points are there? So you can calculate how many, and then you could ask that, okay, maybe this should be somehow the number of minima that each configuration. So this is the pairing, yeah, X, A, J, X, B, J would be endpoints of, how to say like that, endpoints of A dash A for each J. So it's a pairing and you have this many of different pairings. And uh, then we struggled a lot to prove it. And while doing so, we found something quite interesting. So first of all, how the proof goes is that, okay, so let's take a minimizer, which exists by lower, lower semi-continuity. So we know it's a hyperbolic geodesic so I should say geodesic multicord, sorry. We invented this term because 
it's somehow this interaction again. So let's take that. You can actually construct an associated rational function. It's related to some um, uh, covering of the Riemann sphere. I'm gonna show a picture on the next slide. So each of these guys, each of minima gives a certain rational function. And the critical points of the function are the end points of the curves. Uh, and okay, I want to go to the upper half plane. Again, in the picture will be soon. And uh, somehow each configuration of curves will be giving a different rational function. Uh, because each geodesic multicord with different configuration, different pairing is of course somehow different. And you see from the construction that in this number one, you will find a Catalan number of different rational functions with the same critical points, which are the endpoints of the curves. So the endpoints stay the same. I just change how the curves are connecting together, okay? So that's an explicit construction. I will show it in the next, next slide if I have time. Uh, uh, then you can use a result from algebraic geometry saying that there are no more than this many. So we found everything. So this is number two. And then as a side result, you find classification of these rational functions, which was the kind of we didn't know about this before, but we found out that it was a big problem in algebraic geometry some time ago. So it was quite fun. Um, so let me show the explicit construction. Maybe it makes more uh, clear. So now we work in the upper half plane, which is here. These are my marked points. I fix some. So this is a geodesic uh, multicord. So that is a minimizer of the potential. Then I can do, okay, let's make copies on the lower half plane by just reflecting, supposed to be symmetric. Then I construct a rational function as follows. So I pick one face. So now I have this graph with vertices, the marked points, and then I have edges here on the real line, and then these curves. So I pick one face, maybe this purple one. I map it to so in this picture, lower half plane, oops, H star, conformally. Then I do Schwartz reflection across the hyperbolic geodesic. So I get the yellow region, which will be mapped to the other side. The reflection goes somehow over here. And then I keep on reflecting. So every other cell will be, you know, going to the lower half plane and every other one will be going to the upper half plane keep reflecting. I can do this because I have a geodesic, hyperbolic geodesic. Geodes so each uh, edge in the graph are hyperbolic geodesic. So I can do that. I find a rational function and the critical points. So you find a branch cover of the Riemann sphere and it's ramified exactly at these end points of the curves. I hope from the picture, it's a little bit clearer. And for each configuration of curves, I will get a different function because these cells will be different, right? And um, so that will be actually a real rational function. Make, does it make some sense? Yeah. Yeah, I start with geodesic multicord. That is a minimizer of the potential. I find a rational function. I'm sorry, there's a lot of terminology that I just made up because we had to call this somehow something. So then, okay, I should stop. So I will maybe show this one. So then what was the curiosity? We learned later that there's a conjecture about classification of these rational functions. If you have all, all critical points on the real line, like in my example, uh, the conjecture says that you can find a rational function, which is actually real, when you do some Möbius transformation. So there's an equivalence class uh, with respect to Möbius maps. So there's a representative, representative, which is real. And from our construction is immediate. So we kind of accidentally got this and then we learned it was some big conjecture. This is actually a special case. So there's a bigger conjecture. Uh, 
proven by these people about Krasmanians. I'm not gonna go there, but I just wanted to somehow point it out because it was quite interesting, at least to me. And as a last remark for the channel case, so I looked it up, it's proven using uh, the Bethe ansatz for the semi-classical limit of uh, Knisnik homological equations. Uh, I think this is the only proof. So it goes via mathematical physics. And it has something to do with our setup, but I didn't talk about it here. So we have some semi-classical quantum field theory also going on here, but that's maybe for later to investigate more. Okay, thank you. And sorry for going over time. Thank you very much, Evelina, for this uh, very nice and uh, very clear talk. Um, is there any question from the audience? So I think I have one uh, question that is related to the to this last thing you were saying. I mean, so uh, what I was wondering is, is in what sense uh, uh, should I think of this limit as a semi-classical limit? So, um, so what's the if whether you can tell us something about the quantum field theory? I mean, whether there is one. I mean, the, the theory aspect yes. of this. Uh, uh, yes, I can. I think it's just here. <laughs> Uh, I will read it. It's my last slide. Uh, there's one more. So, okay. So, let's see. So, H was this uh, Lerner potential. So, the rate in the large deviation uh, result, at least essentially. It depends on this conformal moduli. Let's, let's say we are in the upper half plane with this. That's actually what I was talking about lastly. Just pick the points on the real line. And okay, so now we know that the minimi uh, minimizers exist. So this infimum is actually min, and it's given by this uh, geodesic multicord of which there is Catalan number of. But anyway, so that thing exists. It depends on the conformal moduli. So I can say it's if I fix the domain and just move the points, these are the endpoints of the curves, it will be a function, right? And now you can find that this function satisfies the semi-classical BBZ equations. Uh, so I don't know if you, you must know the BBZ equations, maybe. It's very famous, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the second order level two degeneracy virus or representation theory, but you need to take kind of a semi-classical limit and they become this kind of non-linear equations like here. Uh, I, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, so um, you, you mentioned that kappa equal to three uh, is related to the easing model. Yes. Uh, now, uh, the, the, this, uh, I mean, you investigated small values of kappa. Uh, are there any interesting, uh, I don't know, physical models where small kappa uh, shows up? Uh, that's an excellent question, because these kind of very uh, traditional models, you have uh, the kappa is pretty large. Yeah, it was three for the easing model, for example. If you take uh, spanning trees, then you have kappa equals two for loop rest walks. But uh, less than that, um, so I don't know of any kind of famous critical model related to that. Uh, however, you can think about these, somehow where these guys come from, they are some semi-classical limits of, I briefly mentioned, some functions which depend on kappa when kappa goes to zero. And these functions, you can relate to any SLE kappa, so here should be kappa. And these can be seen as uh, uh, correlation functions in, uh, Conform of field theory with certain central charge. But then the question is whether there's a discrete model for that conform field theory. I do not know. Thank you. Um, um, other questions? Sir? Slight question. Uh, could you explain quickly what is this SLE partition function, Z kappa? 
Mm, okay, I will try. Let me go back to the, the where we had this several. Maybe here I can do. <laughs> so uh, let's say we have. So first of all, we have uh, the usual SLE, just one curve, let me say. Okay, sorry, it's a notation. Maybe P is just this uh, one SLE kappa, one curve. It's gonna be very kind of sketchy measure, probably law. Okay. May, okay, it needs to depend on some points. So maybe X, Y is the endpoints. So then I can take just uh, independent. So then this would be in my notation. I need to label them somehow. So that would be just independent. That's the product measure, but that's a bit wrong. So what I need to do to get somehow P, let's say, I don't know, N, S, L, E, Kappa. Uh, will be, let's do like that, uh, absolutely continuous. Let's say, okay, couple less than four for the experts with respect to this independent, but there's interaction and that is related to the partition function. So I should put something here, maybe rather Nicodem derivative. So it will depend on everything. And that one will have uh, somehow it's encoded in. So there's somehow dependence on uh, the moduli, uh, which are these endpoints, and then the curves. So there's the randomness. Oof, there's some echo. And for the moduli, we have usually call it Z. It's just. Uh, kind of data, it depends on the domain as well. And uh, yeah, so that's a little bit maybe abstract. I think a better way to say it, okay, I don't want to be too precise. Let's say like that, I take total mass of this, this one. Uh, so actually maybe I should have tilde because it's not probability measure yet. So this is probability measure one curve. Then I take a product measure, but I'm waiting by something. So my, my might actually get something which is a measure but not a probability measure. And indeed that will have a total mass, which is this uh, Z. And that will depend on the points. Maybe that's the shortest answer. I can give another answer if you want using Lerner evolution. But does this make any sense? Uh, yes, but uh, you, you have not precised uh, the formula for R, of course. But uh, yeah, if you have the other answer with uh, the equation, uh, it would be nice. Yeah, so one way to precise R is again put this Brownian loop measure there, which is a little bit. Uh, Ah, oh, maybe I can. Ah, I think I might be able to remember it. So it is exponential of, okay, some size might be wrong. There's the central charge related to kappa. Then there's the Brownian loop that, that we already discussed of the curves. If I'm not mistaken, I might have messed up some, maybe there's some other factor involved. Oh uh, yeah, so there is another product of Poisson kernels, I think. Uh, how to call it? I should look it up actually to remember it. Yeah, which goes where? But these are the ingredients anyway. 
And that's how you see this one appearing in the energy. So you need to do a certain type of weighting. Yeah, this M look depends on kappa or? Uh, kappa is here. Only here. Yeah, and this doesn't. So it's the same as we had in the formula for the energy. So there's no kappa, it's just the loop measure. It depends on the curves, gamma, which yeah. are these guys. And then kappa is here. So this is a functional of kappa uh, related to the central charge of the theory. And uh, so that one will depend on kappa. And if you take a kind of classical limit of that one, I think the Poisson kernels are here, but I might have forgotten where they should go. They are just some explicit stuff. Mm -hmm. So that will converge to this uh, BPZ. So that will actually, uh, BPZ, yeah, BPZ, that will satisfy BPZ equations. Then, in the quantum field theory, mm -hmm. the usual ones. And then when you take the limit, you will find this classical kind of PPC. But the, the limit that you mentioned at the end was that kappa times the log of this uh, yeah. partition. So kappa times the log, this is more or less the M loop. Yeah, I think you take uh, that and that will go to, as I call the U. Yeah. That's kappa. That's, That's the parameter, not the power. Yeah, but if this Z kappa is exponential, you know, C of kappa uh, times M loop, the, the C of kappa that uh, is linear. Ah, uh, uh, so there's also this one. Ah, yes. So, ah, okay, 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 okay. Yes, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. And now I forgot if I need to divide. So I need to set these formulas up properly to have them, you know. Oh, yeah, and there's some power here. Yeah, something like uh, 2H of kappa, which is the catch conform weight. Yeah, it's a bit complicated, but you uh, have these Poisson kernels that we've seen before. There's just some kappa kind of power depending on kappa. Then there's this function that's a little bit mysterious and they are related to this loop measure. And when you plug things together, you will find that the definition with the loop measure was natural to have somehow these ingredients there. And then this kind of independent part. So I had independent part, interaction part, and somehow conform a moduli part mm -hmm. in the definition. Yeah, it's a bit messy, I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine, perfect. So we have written it in the paper, so you can check. And you can tell me which ones are wrong here because I probably wrote them a bit wrong here in this. So don't trust me completely. No, no, but the, intuitively the, the, the explanation is fine. Yeah, so then uh, Z kappa uh, solves, solves uh, BBZ mm. uh, with, with, okay, there's a central charge kappa in, in CFT of central charge C, o, C of kappa. And I'm writing all over the place. So now I probably do it wrong again, but uh, it's something like, yeah, eight minus three kappa, uh, six minus kappa over two kappa. And you can check that kappa equals, let's say four should be C equals one. So it might be that this minus sign. And kappa equals three should be, where is the free fermion? One half, right? Anyway, there's a numerology between all these things. And uh, that's where this number 12 is coming from. Because you have all this thing that you're taking a limit of. But there's a concrete, I just quickly mentioned, I think it's nearby uh, here. So if you want to have these several points, you need to keep track of them and they are in influencing this. Uh, so that you look at one of these, maybe gamma one, and these other guys are there and they are influencing it. So then the driver is not only brown emulsion, but we'll have plus a drift. 
uh, DT. Uh, okay. D, if you write the SDE, okay, that should be DPT. And then that's a, that's a plus sign, DT, drift. And what is here is a derivative of log Z of times kappa. So it's also visible more, maybe more concretely in this picture of the learner theory. If you want multiple marked points, you need to encode them here in this Z in the partition function. And that is basically the drift you have to put to Brownian motion to get this interaction. That's another way to think about it. Okay, um, other questions? Okay, so doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you very much, Evelina, again, for being with us for this very nice uh, presentation. And sharing the screen, so 